Today I'm going to show you what's inside of this Honda R18 engine and how it works. Now this one's out of a 9th gen Honda Civic with 210,000 kilometers on it. Apparently it's got a head gasket leak so we're going to tear this thing down to see what's inside and how it works. Now these 1.8 engines have actually been generally reliable coming up on 20 years now since they've been out there with the exception of early models that had issues with the blocks cracking. Link above if you want to check out that video. I'm going to start by removing this plastic valve cover. Now if you remember this generation was where Honda went El Cheapo and everything thinking that people would actually buy it. They're not captive. Interesting. It's a broken dipstick, but at least there's no dipstick tube. Such a simple valve cover design. There's nothing really to it other than the oil cap and a PCV vent hose. Now this is the 2000s where people got scared out of their SUVs due to the fuel crisis and went back to economy cars like this. As a result, Honda didn't put real VTEC in, they've got economy VTEC in here, or IVTEC. Essentially, you've got a rocker arm system with a shaft that runs along the center here, and that's going to press down on a camshaft that's down below, which is powered by a timing chain. Those rockers are then going to correlate to these valves here to open them up or not open them up at different heights. Kind of a complicated setup for an economy car. You also need to do manual valve adjustments once in a while, otherwise the top of this engine is going to be clucking around like a chicken. Let's pull off this rocker arm system. Let's pull this out. See if we can lift this up and over. Now if you look at the cam profiles, you'll see that these two look normal, whereas this one here doesn't have any lobe on it, it's essentially flat. Which means that this valve here, correlating to this arm over here, is not going to open up in normal operation. Now unlike normal VTEC, where you put more air into the engine for more power, this is essentially conserving air, so less air equals less fuel and better economy. And when VTEC kicks in, you'll this metal rocker arm is going to lock to the other two and they're both going to follow this higher cam profile as it rocks back and forth therefore allowing both valves to open up for maximum airflow. Now performance versions of VTEC would have normal cam profiles on both of them allowing air to pass through and an even higher cam profile on the middle set so that you can add even more air at extremely high RPM. The VTEC is actuated by putting oil in through the end pipe over here where it goes down the pipe and that little plunger is then going to lock into the adjacent arm over here in this pocket and and then they can rock together. And here's where you can see the holes for lubrication and for the activation of the VTEC system. Now if you want to learn more about how VTEC works, I've got a more detailed video linked above. I'm going to next remove this plastic air intake. Can you imagine removing this in the car against the firewall? Now I can remove the intake. There's no flaps or any motors or anything. Got a mass airflow sensor and the throttle body mounts up to there. Keeping it simple is keeping it cheap and easy to run. Never mind, there actually is a tumble flow control motor. In the back of the motor, this looks like an EGR pipe. Pretty crusty with soot. And we've also got a water outlet. These two coolant and exhaust passages pass through each other, so it helps to cool it off. This is the cam position sensor. This was the last of the era of port injection. Essentially low pressure fuel comes into here and the fuel rail distributes it through these injectors here directly into the airstream as opposed to in the combustion chamber. Therefore you won't have any issues with carbon buildup. This was also the era of having cheap injectors that are easy to replace, unlike a direct injector which will cost you three or four times the amount. Next up was come to the timing side of the engine where we have an external water pump. See, that's easy to get to, it's not driven by a timing chain. Gonna get this belt tensioner off, it's an 8 mil heck. Okay, got it with the bar. You gotta remove this in order to do the water pump which is kind of annoying. Alright, let's get this water pump out of here. Look at this, it's nice and old school. You got a metal impeller on this side and a metal flange on this side. The body is all made of aluminum. Alright, let's get all these 12 mil bolts off the timing cover. Alright, now it's time to see if we forgot any bolts. Okay, here we have the timing cover. So the timing chain cover feels nice and chunky and that's because it's part of the engine mount. Over here we have the inlet and outlet for the oil pump which is integrated into the casting and directly driven off of the crankshaft. I like that because there's no extra chain that you have to worry about. You've also got this little pocket you can remove and check on the timing chain tension every Thanksgiving to make sure it's well fed. And here's a look at the timing chain setup on the R18 engine. It's very simple, just a cam to crank with a 1 to 2 ratio, a hydraulic chain tensioner and plastic timing guides which aren't known to fail like some other brands, Mr. Audi and Volkswagen. I'm going to pull off this timing chain tensioner. Yeah, and here you can see the little hole where it's going to feed it oil. There's the chain tensioner in pretty good shape. It's a mid mileage engine. Gear off. And the chain. Now this chain is thinner than a bicycle chain. Rightfully so. It is a small engine, but I feel like you should use a thicker chain than this. Especially with all the forces from that IVTEC system. <laughs> Five mil hex holding this one on. No! Alright, I got it by hammering a T45 onto it, and then there's that bolt. 
And this slide is looking in decent shape as well. Now this is the VTAC switch that sends oil pressure to the rocker arms. And here's an oil pressure sensor. Here's the oil pressure switch. Looks like a VVT solenoid, a little bit smaller. Let's get the housing for it off. Now on a lot of Hondas, if you've got a little bit of an oiling issue, a lot of junk is going to end up in this screen. That's going to affect your VTEC performance and make your engine run like a pig. Now another sore spot for most Hondas is this EGR system. This is the EGR valve and you can see how clogged up it is with soot. When this gets clogged up and your engine is going to start throwing a fit like a Honda fit. Let's remove this coolant outlet. You can see you've got a coolant temperature sensor there. There we go. Here's what the sensor looks like inside of the coolant flow. And here we've got the coolant inlet. And the thermostat this was before the era of digital thermostats now i'm going to remove this coolant junction block now if you haven't noticed i'm using two different guns with a 10 and a 12 that's all you need to take apart a honda engine i'm going to take this off here struggle here with the coolant crossover tube finally we got it off now that gasket is not a good idea can you believe it this engine is so simple it's already time to take off the head the 14 millimeter 12 point sockets That one was also loose. So I'm gonna say cylinder two head gasket fill. Alright, I'm gonna go ahead and zip these off. Let's remove the head. Now this used to sit like this. And as soon as you turn it over, you can see there's some burn marks here and some burn marks here. Indicating a cylinder two to three head gasket failure. Allowing the coolant and the combustion to mix together. And then you run out of coolant and overheat this. Now the story is the same on the block. Check out all the crusty stuff inside of the water jacket. And of course the little rust marks here in cylinder 2 and cylinder 3. Now if you compare it to the other two cylinders, it doesn't look like it's been steam cleaned. Definitely notice that these two are different than the outer two, which more or less look more normal. Question is what could cause this overheating? Well, if you have a leak elsewhere in the cooling system and the coolant disappears, the first thing to kind of heat up is this zone over here. Because remember the coolant on the outside here cools these cylinders almost all the way around, whereas these ones are only cooled across the top and the bottom. Now these two head bolts were also loose, so whether they came loose over time or they were loose from the factory, which I doubt because this car had 210 on it those would also cause this to either lift up or during the overheat cause it to warp and that's what slacked those bolts up regardless the extent of this damage could have been avoided if the civic owner would have noticed that digital space dashboard of theirs indicating that it was overheating and just pulled over this does have a plastic insert inside of here it feels almost rubbery like hard plastic all right let's try to turn this upside down so we can access the oil pan i went in and grabbed the wife's sweater it's summer so she won't need this and by the time she knows this is gone She'll forget about it. We just get this AC bracket out of the way. All right, let's get all these tens off for the oil pan. Glad to see they're using aluminum and not plastic. Again, this is before the time. Let's just pull off this oil pan. Taking a look inside this oil pan, a couple of little barnacles inside of there hanging out, but nothing too sludgy. Somewhat milky and expected of a typical head gasket failure, but nothing alarming. You also got to note the inlet and outlet for the oil filter, which hangs out on here. I typically don't like that because those O-rings have a potential to create an oil pressure leak. I mean, you could have just stuck the oil filter on the block somewhere. All right, taking a look inside of here, the oil dipstick actually just came through here. That's where the rest of it went. We do have a plastic oil pickup tube, which I typically don't like. If your engine blows up, all this plastic is going to yeah, yeah, that doesn't really matter at that point, does it? Let's remove it. I don't see any junk in there. Here we have the windage tray, and that helps to collect the oil near the bottom of the engine. This one's stamped steel and not plastic. Nice. Now the crank gear is keyed with this slot here and it just pops off. Now this engine doesn't have a huge aftermarket compared to the K series for example. However they are using 14 millimeter headed bolts which are a lot better than the L15 turbo engines you get in current Honda Civic SIs. Here let's zip these off. See, this is why I like Honda engines. They're built very strong. Not only do you have the main cap bolts holding it, you've got all these other 12 millimeter bolts going all the way around this upper oil pan slash main bearing casing. It's all a ladder frame design. There's actually no separate pieces like you get in the L15. Got one of my bolts for the engine stand in here. Let's remove that. Let's pop this up. There we go. Nice and strong and heavy. Take a look at those main cap bearings. And take a look at these bearings. Almost as nice as a German car at 20,000 kilometers. Except this has 10 times the amount. Now this motor never came with a crank bolt. So only now I'm able to rotate it. It's not super smooth, but it's not stuck either. So by the way, the new Civic engines use an 8 millimeter bolt here. This is at least a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. 
And those engines fetch like almost 200 horsepower. Take a look at these bearings. And look at that, absolutely pristine. This is gonna make a little mess, but uh, let me push this piston out. Spin the engine over, much easier to turn now. These bearings are in good shape. You could probably flip them over and reuse them, just like my brother in his underwear. Let's take a look at these pistons now. I've got the polka dots on the side there, which means that you don't have much skirt wear. These pistons are very small and very light. Now this is a 1.8 liter engine, so that is to be expected for 130-ish horsepower. The oil control rings on the outside here are barely starting to clog up a little bit, and that's where you can see some of that carbon starting to build up. So it was starting to burn a little bit of oil, which is normal for this mileage. All right, let's remove this crank. I'm gonna remove the block from the stand. Oh, it's a light boy, look at that. So now that we've got this engine torn down, let's take a look at some of the components and how the lubrication system works. Essentially, we've got the oil pickup tube at the bottom that draws in oil over here. It's then gonna force it to go into the oil pump through this port over here. And that's where it goes to the oil pump inside of the timing chain cover. This is a gear style oil pump, which is driven off the crankshaft. It's not variable, no oil control valves, just very simple in and out. Oil from the pump is gonna go into this upper oil pan, then into the filter, which is in the oil pan itself, and then back into the block. Now oil from that oil pan is gonna be sent down in here, into this galley, which is drilled along the length of the block here. You can see these sprayers are actually tapped into it to lubricate the walls with oil, and also the main bearings tap into it for oil. Teeing off of that main, we've got a galley that comes out this way, and then to the timing chain tensioner, and then that's gonna go to this hole, which feeds the head for the VTEC system. Now on the side of the block here, we do have an oil trap with a PCV system. Let's see if we can get these bolts off. Try this back here. And here you can kind of see a labyrinth where the air is gonna pass from the crankshaft side all the way back up into the valve cover through the oil drain back holes over here. Let me know if you guys want a dedicated video on how PCV system work. There's a lot more to it than just this. Camshaft, let's try. Press here. There we go. An absolute brilliant piece of machine work. You can imagine to get all the precision right how long this would take and what kind of machine setup. And then think of the mass production of these Honda Civics that are out there. As an engineer, I find that very interesting. Now, of course, some of that oil is going to feed the VTEC system like we saw earlier. And some of it has to go in the channel here to fill the camshaft with oil. And through these grooves here, that's how these bearings get lubricated. Now, there's no dedicated cam bearings. It actually rides inside of the aluminum here. You can kind of see there's actually some grooves in here. Camshaft is in such good shape. I should probably use some of my daughter's cocoa melon toothpaste. Polish this up and put it up on market place is a brand new one. Now in all honesty besides the VTEC system this is actually a very simple engine. Things are very simple and that's the key to making them very reliable. Of course with the exception of the first couple of years where they had that crack block issue. Now if you've got one of these the transmission is definitely going to blow before the engine does. So make sure you take care of it or drive a manual transmission if you're okay driving an economy car for the rest of your life. This engine is a real testament to show what things used to be like being very simple and reliable. Of course before all the emission stuff and turbocharged and direct injection stuff kicked in. If you want to see a teardown of the current Civic and Accord motor, check the link above because those engines are not doing very good to be honest. Now if this video was helpful, support me on Patreon and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.